Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Investor uh, for the Property Investor podcast. And uh, today we have um, someone a little bit different, bit different. Um, on the surface, he might seem like a buyer's agent, but he's not. Um, and that's why I've got him on the podcast, Trent Alexander. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Owen. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and um, uh, we came across each other on, uh, of all places, TikTok. Um, so... Um, <laughs> It's uh, which is a fun place to hang out and um, and see people talking about uh, property investing. Um, lots of interesting conversations happen on there. Um, mm. But um, yeah, t- tell us a bit about uh, your service and how it's different to your uh, to a, what a buyer's agent is and and um, and and why you you started doing it. Yeah, sure. sure. So So I'm a a property uh, advisor. Um, I think the technical term is property investment advisor, but I like to say property advisor because I don't just help people with investments. I help them with their homes as well. So um, really the service that I do, it's property education and, and advisory. So what I do is work with clients to really help them navigate the property market to understand I guess the rules of the game, but then also how they apply to a particular set of circumstances for the individual person. So I kind of help them to uh, build a brief for their purchase. So we look at the long term in terms of what could be possible for them if they wanted to build a larger portfolio. But what we really focus on is what is the most meaningful first or next step in their journey and Mm -hmm. and go from there so i guess different to a buyer's agent in that i don't do the buying i I do the strategy part of it Um, and that's a been a very deliberate decision for me because i worked in a buyer's agency and i did the strategy component and i just fell in love with it Um, but it also allows me to to help people all across the country Um, i'm very much of the opinion that a good buyer's agent is a specialist in a particular area and what I like to do is is to work with people all, all across the country to learn a bit about those markets, educate the the people wherever they live about how the system works, um, and then learn the, the intricacies of what makes that market or that location a little bit different to others. Um, and then if they need it, I partner with buyers agents to help them execute on that on that um, brief and to fulfil it if they also need that help as well. Right. Okay. And um, so, so you were working as a buyer's agent to begin with. I worked in a buyer's agency. In a buyer's agency. As, as the strategist. So as someone who's, who delivered the brief still. So same role, but within yeah. a broader um, business that also had buyer's agents under the umbrella, if that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so we were talking about financial planners briefly earlier before I hit record. And so you're like a financial planner, but only for property. Um, yes. Yeah, but you can't call yourself a financial planner, of course. <laughs> no. Um, and um, because a lot of people don't realise that financial planners can't talk about direct property investment and give advice on it. So yeah, you're really filling that uh, that hole about um, um, about what people should buy, um, where and how, and so on. So um, yeah. sounds like a, a great service to me. Um, and uh, if I was to get back onto uh, that side of the desk, I, you know, I, I'd uh, that that's what I'd love to do is is helping yeah. clients uh, with the strategy is is the most interesting part. Um, because there's plenty of people out there that love doing the 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 wheeling and dealing and and the 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 buying of the property and the negotiation, but yeah, mm. the the strategy is um in a lot of the parts, a lot of the times is what's left out. Um, I think so. Absolutely. And I also think that if you look at a lot of businesses in the market, they often cater to a particular segment of the market. And so what I've found and and part of the reason for going out on my own and creating my business is that I believe good strategy is actually forming a strategy around the client and understanding the rules of of what makes a good property investment, but actually how that relates to a particular um, set of circumstances because certain what I found is that bo- certain buyers agents will target a particular segment of the market and in my experience what what has ended up happening is that it, it becomes basically the the job of the consumer to determine whether or not the business that they are partnering with is actually 
the business that's looking for them as the client. And so what I wanted to do is really flip that on its head because I've been in property my entire professional career. Um, I've been in this side of, of of the industry for about five and a half years now. I've seen first time buyers that are doing their best just to, you know, scrape together the deposit to enter the market. And I've worked with people that realistically they don't they're not even doing it for anything other than the storing wealth within property and everything in between and so what i've learned in that time is that what you have to really do is play the game at your level and then if, if if your circumstances change then then we make tweaks to that but i think too many people unfortunately they're kind of playing they're playing the property game if you can call it that at a level that actually doesn't align with their personal circumstances a lot of the time and that tends to be where people make some mistakes or get it wrong or just don't get the result that they're looking for Mm, interesting interesting and um you say you work with a lot of buyers agents now you'll refer their your clients to them Mm. um what type of buyers agents do you do you work with and um and um and and how do you come across them how do you sort of find them and and vet them yeah so i guess having been in the industry for such a long time i've been fortunate enough to to meet a lot of people along the way um because i work nationally i've made a point of only partnering with buyers agents that operate on the ground in a particular location everything in terms of the the research the strategy I can do for my clients. I do that anyway. So it's yeah. really the execution that I need help with. So I want someone who lives and breathes a particular location. So if I've got a client who's buying in Perth, then I'm only going to partner with an, a buyer's agency that solely operates in Perth and isn't spending half the week flying elsewhere. Yeah. Not that you're flying out of Perth at the moment, but you get the theory. <laughs> um, so that's that's part of it. But also, um, so I'm a member of PIPA, the Property Investment Professionals yep. Australia. Um, so I've met a fair few people through that, which has been great. Um, we sort of all work to the same code of um, ethics, which is, is certainly helpful. So I've met people through there. Um, but also I've worked in a business that had exposure in Melbourne, Sydney and in Brisbane already. So I've got a lot of people that I met through that. I actually lived in, I'm from Melbourne, but I lived in Brisbane as well. Um, yeah. And subsequently, I know so many buyers agents in Melbourne and Brisbane. I've almost got too many options for people. But at least in Brisbane, it's great because you sort of you've got people that can serve us up into the Sunshine Coast and down into Gold Coast and stuff like that, which is great. So, um, yeah, and then I've, I've worked with people in um, Sydney, in Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane uh, and Melbourne as well. So I've got connections almost everywhere for the vast majority of people now, which is okay. great. And is it only capital cities or do you look at regional areas as well or? No, absolutely happy to look at regional. I find it's a little harder to find a buyer's agent to partner with regionally in some markets, so it would yeah. depend. But definitely, I look at any market for for a client. Um, so it's really about understanding what their budget is and how far that budget takes you. Because you know you could have a million dollar budget, and it's in some markets that's an incredible budget, and in others it doesn't really buy you much. Um, So I've always said that the only fair way to compare one property to another is actually by the price, not the location um, for that exact reason. So what I also do is I look at whether or not the client is actually ready to buy at that particular time. So because it's a fee-for-service model and and it's not paid on success of, of the purchase of a property, I will workshop the idea of are we ready to buy today or is there a really valid reason to maybe wait until we hit a particular milestone, whether it's an income or a savings milestone before we jump in as well. So Mm. what I tend to find is a lot of the people that I work with are often they're trying to toss up between, you know, either buying a home or an investment or maybe extending their home or doing a knockdown rebuild or buying an investment. So it's really scenario building to say, okay, if we go down this path, this is what is likely to happen. If we go down a different path, this is the likely outcome. Which do you prefer? Here is my professional opinion. And then we work on a plan to go and execute that whenever that may be. And and do a lot of people come to you already um, sort of finance approved? Have they seen a mortgage broker or or, um, are they looking for you to you to sort of help them with that? I can help them with that. It's about 50-50. I think mortgage okay. broking seems to be the most commonly understood service in the industry, which is good. Um, but what I found, and this is a little bit Victoria-centric, but there are certain government schemes that 
are actually limited by which finance provider can offer them. So it gets a little bit tricky um, sometimes because I think that their brokers aren't necessarily aware of absolutely all of the products. So a good example in Victoria is that there's a really good shared equity scheme with the government. But unfortunately, there's a lot of talk in the media at the moment, the fact that no one has, not many people have taken this up. But I think the reason is, is that you have to either be working with CBA or Bendigo Bank to have access to the whole thing. If you open that up to brokers, everyone would be doing it. Um, so there's little, you know, sort of quirks like that that you have to be aware of. But there is a, a significant proportion of people that come from a mortgage broker because the mortgage brokers help them, but also acknowledge that maybe these people don't have enough property knowledge um, to really pull off what they're trying to pull off, if that makes sense. And yes, yeah, like a lot of these um, yeah, government uh, schemes to help people, um, yeah, other than just um, a, a, a cash handout, um, a lot of them are half baked and and yeah, full of bureaucracy, and and um, so they're they're difficult to execute. So a lot of people don't end up taking them up. Yep. Um, it's um, okay. So so um, mortgage brokers would probably help um, a, a lot with um, uh, would be a good help. Um, I mean, it'd be uh, good for both sides in terms of. You know, if they've got pre-approved clients, and uh, they need to talk to someone like you. Absolutely. I, I always preface any of uh, my relationships with mortgage brokers to say that they're not going to love me all of the time because I will ask them a hell of a lot more questions and probably get them to do a little bit more work than they're used to. Um, but it will ensure that, that when that client is ready to pull the trigger, that they're actually going to execute now, rather than just having a pre-approval that, that never you know, gets fulfilled because they're not actually able to get what they want within, you know, the way that they've structured their finance, which seems to happen a lot. I talk to a lot of brokers that say they've got clients that just have these perpetual pre-approvals um, that are open and valid, but they never actually draw against the money. They never actually end up buying anything. And I think the missing link is that, that they don't have the brief. They don't know what they're looking for. Or maybe someone hasn't sat them down and said, maybe what your expectations are and what your budget are there's a little bit of a misalignment there yes everyone <laughs> wants um yeah that champagne budget um and um okay and and with the clients that you're talking to at the moment um yeah maybe the last six months um, mm. um but as recent as possible yeah what, what do you see that's happening in 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 the market at the moment and and you've probably got a a, a two-tiered answer here there might be that sort of owner occupied maybe uh, are they are they yeah. those clients more melbourne based where you are or um it's, it's a high percentage but it doesn't, okay. doesn't have to be so probably okay. because of my exposure to melbourne and brisbane i get a bit more from those markets okay. absolutely yeah um, I think, it, I think it's really interesting. Um, I would say this might be a controversial answer, but I, I think there's less noise on the ground from first home buyers in Melbourne than other markets. And I think it's because Melbourne has sat a bit flatter for the last few years. So people haven't really seen prices move that much. And if they're young and if they've been able to save a bit of money or if their their wages have increased, I think whether they'll maybe admit it on a forum like TikTok where we met because it will be met with a little bit of, of anger from others is that I think that that affordability piece has improved a little bit um, for the first home buyers. But in Melbourne for investors, it's the opposite. They're just getting uh, absolutely rolled at every turn, unfortunately. So Melbourne is, I think, probably the most divided market I see where first home buyers are just kind of keeping quiet and not hating the fact that they have some options at the moment. And mm. then there's not as much competition. Um, and then you've got the, the investors that unfortunately are really feeling it. You know, it does have the, the lowest yields in the country. There seems to be a new tax every week that's sort of just taking a little bit more cash flow from them. So Victoria's got some issues, definitely. Um, I, I, as I said, I've done a lot of work in, in Brisbane. That market, unfortunately, like their rental crisis is, is still pretty bad. Um, I think most of, of the investors there have, uh, if they've been in the market a couple of years, they're, they're pretty happy. Their, their market's done really, really well. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting market. It's starting to get the opposite of Melbourne where that home buyer market's starting to really feel the price movements and saying, I, I can't upgrade now or I can't buy where I want to be buying. Um, and then you've got markets like Perth, which is really interesting to me at the moment because the East Coast investors have jumped on it um, and just said, this is so affordable. And it's taking the local market a little bit longer to understand 
shit, things are moving. And if I if I want to actually upgrade or get into the market, I now have to make a decision rather quickly. And for the last sort of 10, 12 years, they haven't really had that level of pressure. And I think it takes the local market a little bit of time to respond to that. Um, so I am a bit of a data nerd and I've looked at the property price movements since 1980. And I can tell anyone who's listening that lives in Perth that this boom is far from over in my opinion. So what I've looked at is the, the relative affordability of each market compared to each other. So uh, mm. Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth and Canberra, which is what the Real Estate Institute of Australia data has for such a long time period. Um, and just as sort of the start of COVID hit, uh, Perth's market was the most affordable it had been on record against every market except Adelaide on that list. Um, yep. 35% of the price of a house in Sydney. Like, that's just ridiculous. Um, and so even because in that time, even Sydney has actually done okay, you know, percentage-wise, not as good, but dollar dollar for dollar, it's done quite well. The affordability yep. of, of somewhere like a Perth and to a lesser extent, Brisbane and Adelaide is still there. And as we know, there are some people on very good incomes in Perth as well. So I personally think that the, the Perth boom has got a little while to go before it's over yet. So it's not going to get any easier. I think days on market is about seven days. Like properties barely hit uh, an open for inspection and they're sold. It's a bit nuts. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, it reminds <laughs> you me know, of the, uh, the, the old days. And um, in yeah. um, in in Sydney, and um, um, which has uh, thankfully um, calmed down to be more of a normal market now. But um, yeah. it, it's... Um, uh, yeah, Perth. Uh, I mean, it was locked up and you know uh, uh, protected or um, uh, or restricted from the rest of the world um, uh, for so long uh, that um, yeah, no one else could really get in. And uh, and I suppose the residents in Perth were really unaware of how good an opportunity it was. Um, so uh, yes, to see what's happened there in the last um, two years. And yeah, there's no sign of it slowing down. And uh, yeah, on on the on the rental side of things, it's um, yeah, it's it's um, uh, it's you still need a good quality property. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, there's um, a, a lot of people buying anything that um, you know has has a um, has a title against it. And um, you know, it, it uh, yeah, there can be unexpected uh, repairs and maintenance, and um, maybe in areas that um, uh, they don't know where is it, uh, where was necessarily a good place to buy. So um, some things can take longer, but good quality property um, that is is still easy to find, um, but you have to jump on it. Yeah, and they're um, uh, easy to rent. Yeah, and that's, I think that's an interesting one for markets like a Perth at the moment where because of the, the rental crisis that we have and the fact that the, you know, rents are under a lot of pressure, to have a market that's done, you know, double digit growth for a couple of years in a row and still have such a strong rental yield for an investor, um, you know, you can see why prices will keep moving because it, it's not at the point yet where the investors are really feeling the kind of cash flow burden that they have in other markets yet anyway. Yeah. Um, so that that will fuel that market, but it does it does feel like it will get to a point where rents just can't go higher. Maybe prices will move, and then you know it definitely is a little bit more cyclical in that the the highs are higher, the lows are lower, and there's just a lot of years in between. Um, yeah. I've never, I mean, in all of the the research I've done, there's never been a market that sat flat for such a long time. Um, Brisbane, Brisbane had almost a decade where prices didn't move much just before its recent boom. But what I looked at, when I looked at the data, what I noticed was even though it sort of didn't really move every year, it was sort of like a 1% increase, 2%, one and a half, you know, for 10 years in a row, Perth's prices actually went backwards yeah. for a good six year period, year on year, only by little bits. But yeah, when you compare that over that time period to Brisbane, all of a sudden there's a 15% disparity and so, you know, it's just playing a massive overdue game of catch up. Yes, and people realise that um, yeah, Sydney always gets talked about as the, the 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 city that keeps on booming, and keeps on giving. But mm. uh, during between two thousand and three and sort of twenty twelve, um, it didn't move much at all. It just sort yeah. of bubbled along and stayed flat. And there were 
you know, a lot of people that pr were predicting that Sydney was never going to grow again because it was so overly priced. Um, yeah. And um, yes, and, and now we're sort of um, prices are three times as much as what it was then. Um, so yeah, interesting. Um, great mm -hmm. conversation, Trent. Um, if people, not not just uh, potential clients, direct clients of yours, but maybe also mortgage brokers and even buyers agents who want to use your service to help um, help um, with their uh, strategy for their clients, um, what's the best way for people to get in contact with it? Yeah, so my website. Besides my TikTok, called, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Property uh, Advisor Oz AUS on TikTok, if, if you're on there. <laughs> Come and heckle me like everybody else. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> my business is called Investments Accelerated, so investmentsaccelerated.com.au, um, same handle on uh, Instagram. I also post a little bit on LinkedIn, so I have sort of different um, different uh, pieces of content on different platforms, but so you okay. get a little bit of everything. But I like, I do um, a weekly blog as well, so I pick a different topic. Um, this week I did a really interesting one um, for uh, Brisbane, what, what 400 grand bought you in Brisbane at the start of the boom? Um, yeah. So it's actually two friends of mine that have spent almost the same money on two very different assets. So it was a, a, a blue chip townhouse versus a, a middle ring, up and coming suburb house. Um, and they both had comparable sales from late last year that were almost identical. So it was a really fun case study. So I like to do stuff like that, um, you know, fairly educational. So um, you look me up on all the socials, you, I shouldn't be too hard to find. Okay, cool. And of course, we'll we'll um, tag you up and uh, link you wherever we're posting as uh, wherever we can on on um, wherever we post this episode or any clips that we have as well. So, um, Trent, it was a great conversation. I, I love the service you provide. I, I think it's invaluable and it, it's really filling a gap that's been missing, especially for property investors, because that's you know, all, all we work, work with these days. And we, we see a lot of people buying properties that it's like, why did you buy that? <laughs> um, and it's, um, yeah, so it, it's um, something that I, I would definitely recommend people do is get professional help from someone who works out the specific strategy for you before um, before you go out and spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I could be could be biased, but I've I've worked with plenty of people, and I've sometimes been really baffled about some of the the purchase decisions that that have been made. So if I can do a little bit to help that process along. Um, what, what I also want to say is that, um, you know, part of the reason for me doing what I do is that I do want to make getting good quality property advice more affordable. Uh, I'm a big proponent of using a buyer's agent, but the reality is as a, as a segment of the market that can't afford that. So yeah. uh, working with a property advisor, whether it's me or, or somebody else, is a more affordable service. So uh, reach out, speak to, to someone in that field and just see if if maybe they can help you because if you if you make the right decision in property, um, that compounds and can have a significant impact to you know your future wealth. Okay. Trent, thanks again. We'll finish it there. And thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of For the Property Investor podcast. And, um, yeah, stay tuned for our um, weekly news that comes out every Monday. And, uh, and of course, we'll have another um, expert series uh, episode uh, coming soon. Thanks, Trent. Cheers, Owen. Bye.